Do you ever look around and think back? I know you've been so many years of you growing, but do you ever look back and think to that young Pat who was looking for answers, trying to struggle? You know, I know in our prior interview, you had talked about some of the earlier stuff when you were living in LA and trying to, you know, figure things out, make ends meet, going to the gym and really trying to like get things together. Do you ever trip out? Do you ever like pinch yourself and go, holy shit, how did, how did this all happen when I was just that young man looking for answers? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's crazy when you're saying this because we're having a conversation at the house the other day. Like you trip out, uh, holy shit. There's, there's no question about it. <laughs> there's no question about it. And a lot of times it's more when I'm talking to my kids late at night and I'm like, you know, like I was saying to my son the other day, I said, do you realize if, if I don't come to the States and my parents don't bring us to America, you're not here. He said, I'm glad your parents brought us. I'm glad my parents brought me. To the-. I said, do you realize if I don't go into that meeting that night, I don't meet your mom? Do you realize if this, and I kind of go through this, right? Do you realize if that day we didn't make a decision on September 23rd, 3.30 in the morning, I wake up in 09 and I tell my wife, I'm resigning today. I'm starting a company and I'm going to go through God knows how many years of just challenges. I said, you guys are not going to be here today. So, so that part of it is a beautiful thing. The concept of where I was at to where I'm at, I've always been a dreamer. Never in a million years did the 18-year-old path think this was going to happen. I went into the Army thinking I'm going to do 20 years, meaning at 18 years old when I went to the U.S. Army, uh, I'm a Hummer mechanic. I'm at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I get every single order I requested from Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Peacock. I'm going to stay in. I'm going to do my 20 years. They went to Virginia. They got my orders to go to DLI. I speak four languages, so they were going to send me to Monterey to uh, learn different languages. I was going to go to Vicenza, Italy. I was going to Sears School, Airborne, Special Forces, 18 Delta, 5th Group. I got every single order I wanted until I got a call one day from one of my friends who called me in the middle of the night, 12 o'clock, and he challenged me to get out. And the next day I woke up, went to my colonel, and I said, I'm getting out. And then, boom, everything changed. So what if I stay six more years? If I stay six more years in the Army, then I'm in it for eight and a half years. I only have 11 and a half more years to retire with 50% retirement benefits. Am I really going to leave the Army? If I reenlist that day, I'm getting out of the Army six years ago at 38 years old, probably been married three times. I probably got seven or eight kids. And... I'm probably broke with $18,000 in the bank, and maybe I'm not even getting out. Maybe I have to stay another five or 10 years to get my 100% pension or retirement. You would have no clue who I am. So the life is literally this close. We were having a conversation right now with one of our guys who got a fat bonus, and he got a fat raise, and the bonus I put for him in 2023, he's literally looking at me with a smile on his face saying, holy shit, I'm going to make a lot of money this year. I said, do you remember the conversation we had? Uh, nine months ago at the sushi spot, he says, I do. I said, do you remember what I told you? He says, of course I remember what you told me. I said, what I told you is the following. I said to you, how many more times are you going to take new challenges and the moment it gets hard, you're going to run away from it? How many more times? I said, Einstein said genius is when you stay with problems longer. Why do you not stay with problems longer until you solve it? Why do you not do that to yourself? I said, your biggest enemy is every time there's a new problem, you, you flight, you run away, you cop out, you do this. Stay with this damn thing for five more months. See what happens. Stay with it for six more months. Stay with it for another year. Stay with it for two more years, and then see what takes place with it. And then all of a sudden, your best friend momentum shows up, and then now you're overpaid. Now you're overly famous. Now you're overly getting credit for what you're not really doing, but what you did a year and a half ago, two and a half years ago. So that concept of staying with problems longer uh, is what sometimes we don't give enough credit to, but life to me is a is a combination if you have a big life or a bad life it's a combination of five major decisions that you'll be in that moment and i'm convinced one day when you die and you're in heaven or you're 80 years old on your deathbed and you're by yourself you're going to go through those five decisions uh one is could be marriage you should have married that girl or you did and it was a good thing or you did it wasn't a good thing so i knew the signals why did i i knew the signals why didn't i it could be drugs, it could be arrest, it could be an opportunity, it could be investments, it could be bad habits, it could be bad friends. You're going to go to those five moments, you're going to say, man, I'm so glad I made that decision. Because of that, I have this, or man, I missed out on that. So, you know, it, 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 none of us can predict fully the future, but it's going to come down to those five decisions. Did did it feel guided for you? Like, were there times where you struggled? Because I know a lot of people, especially in social media age, and, you know, we probably have a pulse, you know, kind of being in our 20s, early 30s. It's a lot different a time than, than you guys where maybe people stayed a little bit longer with stuff. 
And I love that you mentioned that you stayed, you know, you made the decision to stay in 20 years. But there's a lot of people now on social media who are in an opportunity and they shiny object syndrome on social media. Someone says, do this. Someone says, do that. For you, did it feel guided? Did you go, shit, I don't know. Should I do this? Should I do that? Or did it, did it feel like you always kind of knew where to go? Or were there late nights where you go, shit, I don't know if I should leave oh, military to do yeah. this. I don't, was there a lot of, I don't know, asking people for why? 100%. And, 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 and kind of spinning in circles? No or? question about it. Yeah, there's no question about it. I'll give you an idea. So one day, uh, it's me and the, the, the Valley Total Fitness produce a lot of killers, great yeah. salespeople. I'm telling you right now, uh, one of them is in our office, but it produced a lot of great salespeople, right? Yeah. And in, in the L.A. area, there was a few guys that you knew they were going to do something. It was myself. It was another guy named Tariq. It was another guy named Dan. A few other guys, but those are the main names I'm talking about, right? So we all were competing. We're all 21 years old around that age is where we are. So we're sizing each other up to see what's going to happen. But we all know we're not going to do ballets for the rest of our life. We just don't know where people are going to go. So one day, so everybody leaves. A couple of them go into real estate. A couple of them go into loans. A couple of them go into all these different businesses everybody goes in. What year are we talking about? This is 1999. This is 1999, 2000. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, I, I can't go into real estate and loans because everybody's going. I'm going to go in. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go into being a stockbroker. So I go to 9-11. Uh, I go to uh, Morgan Stanley Dean Witter a day before 9-11. Monday. Tuesday is 9-11. 9-10 is my first. I'm like, oh, shit. Bad timing, right? I go to Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, and then I'm sizing everything up. I look at insurance. I look at annuities. I look at 401k. I look at hedge funds. I look at mutual funds. I look at stocks. I look at real estate. I look at, I look at all this stuff. And I say, okay, I know I'm going to be in finance. I just don't know what part of finance I'm going to be in. I'm not going to be doing all of it. I got to pick one of them. So I chose insurance. The other guys, they chose loans. One day I'm at B of A. This is two years later, so it's 04, something like that. I'm at B of A, and I'm in line talking to the teller, arguing over 329.95, uh, uh, what do you call it, over limit fee or uh, over whatever, fee. overdraft fee. And I'm like, this is this, sir, we can't do nothing about it. And I'm like upset at this lady. And then I look to my left, and it's one of the other weekend managers. I said, hey, what's up? You know, I'm like, I hope he didn't hear, but he heard what I was saying. He says, how you doing, Pat? I said, everything's good. Everything good? <laughs> Everything's good. Oh, how great. Very competitive because yeah. everybody was like, who's getting the hot girl? Who's going to Garden of Eden? Who's showing up with the hottest girls? Who's doing this? Yeah. It was so competitive. Yeah. Everybody's competitive and everybody is somebody. Especially like, in L.A. Right? Yeah, and, and, and it was, uh, these were like the main core guys that we were very competitive. And I hear, oh, okay, great. Good seeing you, Pat. Yeah, I'd like to make a deposit of a half a million dollars. <laughs> I'm looking at him. I'm like, this motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah, it's half a million dollars. Oh, Mr. This, his last name. I'm Patrick, but he's Mr. Something. Yeah, yeah. Annoyed the hell out of me. And you're overdrafting so, account. And I'm, I'm dealing with $329 over. <laughs> so I'm like, holy moly. So I go. You know when you're broke and you leave a restaurant and you have dinner with somebody, you're trying to impress them or sell them something? This is the rule of thumb. Always remember this. When people are walking out, if somebody says, you have to go to the bathroom, but great seeing you, they have a bad car. The other guy has a nice car. Sure. Yeah. The person that has a nice car is, is very comfortable leaving with you at the same time to call the valet so you guard to them. So I was the guy that was, oh, good seeing you. I'm going to use the bathroom. And then I would wait outside. Okay, he's gone. All right, can you get my Ford Focus? And then I'm leaving, right? So I go outside the bank and I'm just sitting there in the car seeing what it does. What does he pull up with? He pulls up with a nice, you know, whatever it was at the time, a Lambo or a Porsche or a Ferrari. And he leaves. I'm like, this guy, man, I know I'm better than this guy. So then everybody says, why don't you go do loans? Why don't you go do real estate? Why don't you go do this? You should do that. Look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. And I'm this close to leaving insurance to go to loans. This close. Now, here's what happened. 21 ish, 25 ish, 26 ish. So one day I go to this one guy who's a realtor. Every time I tell these stories, my realtor friends love me because I, I, I you know, talk a lot of shit to them. But this, this, <laughs> and by the way, there's a lot of money to be made in real estate. I bought this property. I put barely God knows how much money down payment. Six months later, I got an offer that gave us 400% return on this because they're building 300 units here. So there is money in this. It's just not my game, right? Real quick, estate. Quick sidebar. How much have you spent on real estate since the acquisition? Not a lot. 20 million? Not to 35 million? 35 million? 30 Jump change for Patrick Bad David. Not a lot. But it's not a lot. If you think about it, it's really not a lot. But 35 million? Um but uh, 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 so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this guy saying he's going to go do this, but I'm coming back 
And I'm sitting there saying, what industries am I going to get involved in? So I'm having dinner with this guy in Valencia one time, 60-year-old man. His picture's everywhere as a realtor. Saturday night, we're having dinner. Great guy, telling stories, making good food, beautiful view in his backyard. It's 9 o'clock. He says, all right, man, I got to go to sleep. I said, you got to go to sleep for what? <laughs> I said, you've been in real estate how long? 35 years. He says, I got to go to sleep. Why? I got a show at 8 a.m. in the morning. I said, you got a show at 8 a.m. in the morning? He says, yeah, I'm a realtor. I said, there's no way in the world I'm going to be a realtor. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I don't want to give up my Sunday. Now, that's me. Yeah, you want to show I knew I'm not going to be a realtor. Then I looked at the mortgage side. Look what's going on right now with real estate. Every five to 10 years in the mortgage industry, you're going to have rates that are going to go up. So if you make three years of a million dollars and you make three years of $150,000, you didn't make a million dollars. You made $3.45 million over a six-year period. So 3.45 divided by six years is what? $550,000 per year. But you lived a life of a million dollar year income for three years. Now your real average is 550. And most people, when they live a life of 1 million, they don't save thinking they're going to be at 550. Boom, lose the house. Boom, sell that pet tech watch for $200,000. You paid $500,000 for it. Sell the other house. Sell this, sell that. And then boom, back at it again. Hey, the next run and the next run. I'm like, what do you have left? And big banks don't buy mortgage companies because the X factor on the EBITDA is very low because it's all based on that personality. There is no renewals. There is no residual. There is no equity. So you can make a lot of money as a loan officer, a lot of money. 100, 200, half a million dollars a month. You can make a lot of money in real estate if you're properly investing it on the side and you're getting rental. A lot of guys are doing that. They're killing it. More power to them. But most guys in real estate and loans don't do that. So I sat there and I said, 20 years, I'm going to give one thing. Which one is it going to be? And then I solved for what I'm going to be building with insurance because insurance wasn't a sexy industry. Not everybody looked at the insurance. Everybody thinks real estate is sexy. Mortgage is sexy. Stocks is sexy. Who the hell thinks insurance is sexy? Perfect. I'm going to go in that space. And if I become a leader in that space, guess what? There's a lot of value for me. I have a lot of leverage. I can make a lot of ass. I can push the weight a little bit. I can push the envelope a little bit. So that's the part where I almost went into real estate and loans. I'm not doing it is because sometimes not enough people think 10 to 20 years. So I, it was this close for me to have left the insurance industry to real estate and loan. And that was one of those key five decisions you talked There's about. There's no question about was it. it. Was it something that you kind of struggled with for over a period of months, weeks, or was it like once you made the decision, you were done, or did it tempt you over the time? Because I'm sure you had hard times with yeah. insurance. It wasn't like you started it and you were on a rocket show. So, so I'm driving. We're having lunch today with my wife. We're, we're coming back. my babe, I love this car. Here's what my wife says. She says, yeah, babe, you're going to get bored in three months. I know you. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? She said, babe, that's your personality. That's why... You can't keep cars for too long. I've never heard you love a car that you want to keep it. And I'm like, listen to her. I'm like, you know what? She's right. The, the crazy part is I get bored very, very quickly where I want a new challenge, right? So I know that area of mine. But I'm also a guy that likes routine. I'm also a guy that likes to sit in the same corner at the same table, order the same three items, have the same waiter. I, I want that to me is also so... Control the controllables. Control the controllables, but also understand the temptation of many options, many opportunities, especially when you become very good at what you do. You know, other people who are like four levels above you, they're going to be like, man, you're doing great in insurance. But if you were only a stockbroker, you're doing great in this. But let me tell you, if you were, to, you're doing great in, but if you were doing solar, we would be making a million. You're doing, you're like, oh, you think I'll do good in solar? Oh, you'll think I do good in this? And it's so tempting, but you can't be naive because every business you go into is hard. Every business you go into is hard. There is no such thing as one industry is easier than the other one and all that other stuff. There's not. You just have to know long-term what you're solving for. So the temptation is going to be there. You have to be aware of yourself. Are you the guy that doesn't stay with problems long? Are you the guy that falls for the temptation and the flattery of, oh, my gosh, you're so amazing. I've never met somebody as eloquent as you. You would do good, so good selling our product. You would be so good doing this. And you're like, oh, my God, this is a great feeling. This is fantastic, but that means for the rest of your life, flattery is going to control you. And if you're controlled by flattery, let me tell you, you don't control your life. People control you through flattery. And it's a, it's a flaw that many of us, it takes us decades to learn that we all have because we like it. You can't fall for it. But flattery ruins a lot of people's lives.